My name is Matt Barber, and today I'm going to be talking about um, Vikings and vampires and the founding of the early Polish state. And I'm probably going to go off into some tangents about how this relates to indigenous uprisings in New Mexico and where we can draw some parallels uh, between the two. But I'm primarily going to be focusing on the time period in Poland's history from about 900 A.D., uh, to 1100 AD. And while I have a lot in these slides here and I can give, God, I could probably give a um, semester long course in the history of early Poland. Today, I'm going to be talking about a few specific aspects. Um, and you, you'll have to apologize while I do speak some Polish, it's not very good. So I'm sure I'm going to butcher some of these Slavic names, but I'll do my best. Everybody should be familiar with what the modern day state of Poland looks like. Uh, this is it here. Uh, this is the modern national uh, flag down below that you can see. And the symbol of Poland is the white eagle here on a crest of red. It's one of a, a, a many Slavic speaking countries that can, that, primarily occupy portions of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, you have three different uh, groups of Slavic-speaking peoples today. You have the Western Slavs, which includes Poland, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. You have the Southern Slavs, which are all those peoples in the Balkans. Uh, Bulgaria is actually a Slavic-speaking nation nowadays, as is um, what, what we now call just recently North Macedonia. And then the Eastern Slavs represent the Belarus, Russia, and the Ukraine. Um, it, it's probably important to note that what we, what we call Russia today is not what um, we would have necessarily called the early Russian state, which was centered in Kiev uh, during the time period I'm talking about. So a lot of times when I talk about Russia in this, this presentation, I'm actually talking about peoples in the Ukraine as opposed to peoples in in, in modern day Russia. And there's quite a bit of distinction between the two. Uh, the Slavic peoples as a whole, there's some debate over where they originate from and what they originate from. Um, if you go to Poland, uh, or as I did, I, I you know worked in Poland about 20 years ago now, um, you, you'd see both interpretations. You'd, you'd see an interpretation that's very um, nationalistic, which is Slavic people had always been in Poland. and But you also get... Um, other interpretations, a more accurate interpretation of pre-Slavic peoples in Poland is, is shown in the Iron Age cultures on the, the right-hand side of the slide. And what you'll see in the area, which pretty much um, spreads from uh, Poland into Eastern Germany, is a culture known as the Lusatian culture. Uh, this was an Iron Age culture which controlled trade between the Baltic and um, uh, civilizations uh, of antiquity further south. Uh, the most famous of those Lusatian sites is, of course, Biskelpin. You can see a reconstruction of it here. Um, Lusatian culture went from about 1500 to 500 BC. They, they, they worked with amber. Their settlements were, were, were forms of these structures that Slavic people would use later, known as groads. They're uh, ringed forts made out of wood, and you can see it here. And, and you'll notice that these forts, um, you'll see standing timbers, but you also see this large bank of just all these timbers kind of put on top of one another, kind of making a huge, thick um, wood wall. Um, th that was kind of the signature of these, these growth structures. And um, they, unlike uh, many groups in antiquity, they they they... They, not only did they fight, everybody in antiquity fought, uh, but they, they primarily rode upon their horses rather than being pulled by chariots. And, and one of the more interesting things for this talk is this Lusatian culture, which is not Slavic in origin, or we don't think it's Slavic in origin. Um, they, they, they appear to have practiced cremation, and it, it's very likely that they, they performed some sort of ritual cannibalism on the bodies. Um, so some sort of consumption of the ancestors to gain strength and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, here are the Slavic languages broken down uh, from Indo-European. Uh, Baltic is, is similar, but it's not the same. Uh, but once you get into the Slavic languages, they break into East, South, and West, which were those distinctions we were talking about before. And then, of course, uh, within the Western group, you have... Um, uh, a, a divide that that comes out of of pretty much um, the the old Polish languages on one side and the old Czech and Slovak languages on the 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 present side. Currently, there are three uh, languages spoken in Poland. Uh, there's Polish, there's Silesian, 
uh, which is uh, slightly it's 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 on the borders with the Czech Republic, and Kashubian, which is the um, uh, version of Polish spoken in in most of old Prussia or was spoken in most of old Prussia. This is a minority in in um, Poland today. Um, here we can see here if we were to to go back in time to to a little just right before the talks the talk in general um the western slavic tribes are located here and the big ones are located in green and you'll notice in the center of all those western tribes is a tribe known as the polans or polani this is the tribe of people that would give poland its name it's it's located today in what is um uh, uh, West Central Poland. Uh, you'll notice that there's another group that's very important known as the Vistalans. Those are located around Krakow in, in kind of southeastern Poland today. And the area around Warsaw is, is, is Mazovia. The Mazovians are the people there. You can also see at the very south portion of the image, you'll see the Czechs and Moravians as well as the Slovaks kind of located there. Um, Another important people, which are, are largely forgotten today, are the Valetti, um, who, who pretty much lived in and around modern Berlin uh, before it was Germanized. And these guys all followed a, a culture similar to Iron Age culture of the Lusatian culture. It's not very different in many ways. In fact, when I was working in Poland, they said that the greatest way to see the difference between Slavic uh, tribes and the earlier Lusatian culture is to break the pottery. And in fact, I, I, this is a terrible way to say it, but in, in one of the, my teachers there, he broke a piece of Slav, uh, of, of Lusatian pottery and it was very hard for him to break. And then he pretty much touched a piece of Pol early Polish pottery and it just kind of fell apart in his hand like a piece of um, um, uh, mud. And he said, it's crap. That's how you know it's Slavic, which I found interesting coming from a Polish person, but that's what he used. Uh, but, uh, Slavic societies were polytheistic. Um, and then the first one of these societies that gets started is not the Czech Republic, not the Slovakia, not Poland, but a, a nation known as Moravia. Um, and that really established as a result of the Carolingians, you know, Charlemagne. He had some campaigns against a group of Turkey people known as the Avars in Hungary. And as a result of these Germanic peoples moving east and fighting these Turkish peoples, kind of in the borderlands between these two groups, um, Slavic people were able to unify and, and, and adopt uh, Catholicism. And these Moravians actually, um, their lands included both Bohemia, the ancestral homes of the Czechs, so they were part of that, as well as the Vistalanias, the, the Vistalans, the um, the peoples in and around Krakow. So, but the state didn't last and it, it falls apart very quickly. Now the Polani are the people of the fields. Uh, they were located in an area which we call today Velka Polska or Great Poland in Western Poland. And in fact, all my research, uh, I mean, I visited other parts of the country, but all my research is in that area between, um, you'll, you'll see in and around the area of the Varta River um, where you see Poznan today, right? In that area, in fact, if you were to draw a line between Poznan and Torin, uh, that's the area I, um, I, the, the region I worked in. There's no clear evidence of a complex state in the ninth century. So in the 800s, they just don't have it. They do have limited contact with the Carolingians uh, to the west, the Moravians to the south, and the Nordic peoples to the north. And, and the, the latter begin to establish themselves in settlements uh, along the, the Baltic coast. So if you look at the Warta River here, you'll notice it flows into something known as the Oder, which, which separates modern-day Poland and... Um, uh, Germany today. So what were the major settlements of the, these early uh, people that give Poland its name? Uh, there was many of them. In fact, the one you see here is uh, Giesno. Um, the, you can see the church on top of the hill at the center of town here. This was kind of the spiritual center of the Poles where the economic center at this point was uh, Poznan. Um, and in fact, there, there's a story that goes into this. In fact, um, the founding of Giesno gives Poland its heraldry, its symbol. Um, so supposedly Lech, who is the brother of Czech and Rus, uh, Rus being the guy who, who would settle and establish Kiev and Czech being the guy who would establish Bohemia, uh, Lech decides to, to found his settlement. He comes upon this hill uh, with a big tree on top of it. Uh, that we could see here. Now, mind you, this tree was probably a pagan. It was going to be a pagan temple. Now it's Catholic church. So take the Catholic church off, put it, think about a large tree there. 
um, he, 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 um, he comes to this area and he, um, he sees an eagle, a white eagle is nesting in the tree. And back in those days, falconry was really big. And he was like, I want, you know, that, that eagle has uh, eggs and I bet you I could train those to be good, uh, good, uh, good hunters for me. And he, uh, he climbs up the tree and the mother eagle attacks him. And so he takes his knife and he starts stabbing at the mother eagle and the mother eagle eventually uh, kicks him out of the tree. And all of his followers are watching him like, what the hell do we do now? And he says, um, we should be like the eagle. So the white eagle um, that fought so hard for its children and fought so hard to keep its home, that's what the Polish people should embody. And the reason they chose the white eagle in a field of red as their, their symbol. Now, mind you, I said it was probably a tree used for um, pagan worship. Here's a list of some of the Slavic gods that exist. There's a lot of them. And, and in fact, if you look there, 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 you know, there's quite a bit of variety in the different gods that exist amongst the Poles and amongst the Rus. And, and some of these guys probably fell in and out of favor. Um, uh, depending upon the time period, but they also fell in and out of favor depending on the settlement. So certain settlements would would worship Dasbog, whereas other settlements would worship Perun as their chief deity. And and Perun is probably the one that most people are familiar with with Slavic um, Slavic culture. And there's good reason for that. Um, in in Polish, it's it's actually Piorun, and in in Lithuanian, it's, it's Perkonis. Um, he's the god of thunder and lightning. Um, if you, you watch your Marvel movies, you're like, I know who the God of thunder and lightning is. He's Thor. Well, this is pretty much the Slavic version of Thor. Um, instead of a hammer, he's got an ax that returns to him. Um, but he's pretty much a, a God of war. Um, he may not have been the, the chief deity prior to the ninth century, but he certainly became popular into the time period we're talking about. In fact, he's popular today. In fact, uh, Polish forces, special forces fighting in Afghanistan or fighting with the U.S. Army, um, their, their special unit, like we have the SEALs, is called Grom, which means thunderclap, and it's in honor of their pagan ancestry. Thunderclap is what Perun would do as he's attacking. It's a, it's a great pagan symbol, and it lives on in, in modern-day Polish military. At the same time, Perun was becoming popular. Viking settlements were occurring uh, on the periphery of the, the, the Polish tribe. Now, the Viking period is, is a long time period, but what I want you to look at is the southern coast of the Baltic, um, that area that just above where it says West Slavs. You'll notice there's a red area right kind of between the border of Poland and um and in, in Germany, this area founded a settlement known as Wolin. Um, the if you're interested in in, in Viking lore, um, the, these people Wolin is thought by many scholars to be the place of the iconic um, uh, uh, Scandinavian settlement of Jomsburg. The greatest Vikings came from Jomsburg, and they're they're almost positive it's Wolin. But whether it's not, whether it is or not, Wolin is at the, the base of the Oder River. So these Poles, these Polani, which are living along the Warta, all of their trade, which goes into the, the Baltic, uh, the, the Baltic Sea, is going along these rivers and it eventually gets to Wolin. So the Vikings, the Nordic peoples living at Wolin, are controlling the trade of the Slavic peoples further inland. And these, these Scandinavian peoples are moving up the Oder in their longships, not only to raid, but to trade and settle. And they're intermixing with the Polani. And they kind of bring the Polani, these, these, these Slavic peoples, under their influence. So at the same time this is happening, um, you're, the Moravian, the Great Moravia falls apart. Now, the Polani had never been a part of Great Moravia, but Greater Moravia falls apart, and um, in its place is going to be Bohemia, the you know ruled by the Czech tribe. At the same time, the Carolingian dynasty of of, of what we would call modern day France kind of falls apart in its 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 wake. Um, is a new Holy Roman Empire centered up uh, further east in what we would call present day Germany under Odo the first, or, and it's also known sometimes as the Etonian empire. Um, 
and, and we're at the height of Scandinavian power. Now, a couple things happen in the, the 10th century in, in rapid succession. The first is the, the Polani unify Wolkopolska. So all those individual settlements, the spiritual center of Giesno and Poznan, they, they get unified, possibly under Lech or more likely Duke Miesko's father, Samuel Sil. Um, during this time in the, 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 the 10th century, the Polani ostensibly convert to Catholicism under Miesko and adopt a Latin alphabet. They get drawn into Catholicism. Um, and the Polani start to move out and they start to conquer the surrounding areas. They conquer Mazovia, the area in and around Warsaw. They conquer the area of Pomerania, which is the area along the Baltic coast. And Silesia, uh, the area that kind of borders upon the, the, um, what, what is today the Czech Republic. But they also take a portion of Great Moravia. So the Bohemia, so the, the, the Czechs aren't able to control all of Great Moravia. It collapses. And the Poles take Wislania, which they call Malopolska or Lesser Poland. These guys had a really important settlement, which is known as Krakow. You can see uh, Wall on the Hill today. Um, now, mind you, this, this center of trade had been going strong since at least the Neolithic. Um, and and it, 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 it certainly was a part, a very important part of Great Moravia. It's located along the Vistula River, which means it controls its own access to the Baltic. I mean, it, it has its own access to the Baltic Sea. Um, it, 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 it's an interesting story, too. Once again, like Gesno, it has this story associated with a hill. In the case of Krakow, it was uh, it was founded by a King Crocus who slew a dragon. He actually fed the dragon, and you can see on this image above here, he's eating the dragon. Yes, this is the king, the guy who looks like a shepherd, a sheep herder. He takes his sheep, and he fills them with sulfur, and he feeds them to the dragon. The dragon eats them, and then the dragon blows up. He gets bloated with the sulfur and blows up, and then um, the hill that that Smoke was was the, the dragon lived on, um, they built their capital of Krakow on top of that hill. The first direct mention we have uh, historically of the Polish state occurs in 963. It occurs when the, the Germans are actually mentioning that the, the Polabians, uh, the, 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 the Polani are fighting the Polabians. The Polabians are the Valetti Union in Eastern Germany. So the Poles are invading Eastern Germany and they're trying to bring this region in purple under their control. Um, they, they fail. Uh, in fact, uh, Miesko, who's, uh, the leader of the Poles at the time is, is, is beaten. The Ottonians, the Germans don't want them interrupting their sphere of influence. So they offer him a deal. They say, well, if you'll stop attacking this area, that's under our, 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 our power, we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll acknowledge that you're a Duke of, um, your lands and, and give you some sort of, um, you know, some recognition in the courts of Europe. Um, you can go kill anybody else. You just can't attack the peoples that are under our protection. And Miesko takes the deal and is made Duke. And it's during this time that he converts to Catholicism. Here's Miesko here in kind of an idealized um, um, image. You'll notice he's holding the cross really close to himself uh, as if he, he really took the cross because he really was convinced Christ in, in Catholicism was the way to go. Uh, that's probably not the case. It was convenient. Um, the, the, we don't know much about his parents, um, but we do know he converted to Catholicism. And he, he married twice. His, his first time was to Dobrava of Bohemia. And he had two really important kids. Um, he had some other children, but uh, two that w w really survived in the historical record. One is Boslav, who was going to become king of Poland, and Sviatoslava. Most people in history, the name Svetoslava has been completely lost. But in the Islamic sagas, the Viking sagas that, that have been published over and over again, and people read them a lot, it's important to note that Svetoslava is actually remembered in most English and in Scandinavian writings as none other than Sigrid the Haughty, which is um, the um, a, a very important wife. She was a wife to several um, great uh, Viking Scandinavian kings, including Eric the Victorious and Sven Forkbeard. Um, she was also the mother of Canute, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, but he, he continues, uh, Miesko fights and continues to fight through his whole career. 
Uh, there's a lot of debate over where he converted to Catholicism. Uh, Poland's a very highly Catholic country today. Um, the, what the site I worked at, Ostrov Letniski, which is um, the one you see here in this image, uh, you'll notice they put a giant iron cross well, it's in the place where they think he was baptized so that everybody going there knows that this is the exact location Miesko was baptized. We don't know that for sure. Um, but we do know that shortly after his um, his his baptize, um, an archbishop was um, uh, Bishops were brought in to, to control and, and convert the population. However, it's important to note that even though there's a lot made of Miesko converting to Catholicism, if we actually look at the peoples that are in this state, it's a mix of many different peoples. So it includes Jews, pagan Slavs, pagan Balts. Those are those Baltic-speaking peoples. Pagan Nords, those Scandinavian peoples. Eastern Orthodox Christians, all living alongside their Catholic uh, counterparts. And it's from this, this diversity of peoples that we get the notion, the first notion of vampires. They weren't, net, they weren't called vampires at the time. Uh, but what we see at these Slavic settlements like uh, Ostrov Letniski or, or, or Giech, which is the one where I did most of my, my burial work, uh, where I first started excavating human remains, um, there, there's two burials, right? There, there's one for the Christians, which is usually inside the church or around the church. And then there's one that's usually outside the settlement for everybody who wasn't Christian. Um, and these burials outside of, of, of the forts are where you find these, these what we would call vampire burials. Uh, vampire burials can have a lot of different means, but uh, so they can be... Um, they can be put with 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 rocks weighted over the legs to keep the bodies from rising from the grave. They can have stakes through the eyes, which is the traditional practice of how you kill a vampire in Poland. I know that sounds weird because we're we think of stake through the heart, but it was actually stake through the eye is what they did. Other places we'll see gravestones put on top of them, kind of like holding them in place. Um, and in these peoples, the, the reason this idea came from is the fact that unfortunately in Slavic, well, fortunately or unfortunately slavic pre-pagan uh, non-christian culture um viewed their their shaman their medicine men as uh, or witches as shapeshifters so a shaman could turn into a werewolf and when a werewolf died he turned into a vampire but it wasn't just the slavic people that had these issues um in 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 um in the Viking burials, right? Most of these Viking warriors were non-Christians. These are people that, that, that believed they could channel the spirit of animals known as berserkers. And the, these, these people that also, these Scandinavian peoples also identified with the, these transformative processes. And adding all to this is the possible idea that the Lusatian culture, that, that, that amongst these, these, Slav, the, these pagan peoples, was the idea possibly of practicing ritual cannibalism, which is probably where the idea of eventually vampires feasting upon blood or feasting, feasting upon the flesh of the living probably comes from. And these burials are actually quite common. They're, they're not uncommon. You'll see sensationalized accounts in newspapers every now and then, but they're actually very, very common. What vampire burials probably represent in the most broadest aspect of what we can tell about early Polish culture is that they represent anybody who is pretty much not Christian that people had a right to fear. Uh, we excavated, I can remember one guy with a gnarly looking foot. It was super tall. He had a stake through the eye, but the, um, the remember he had like a stump foot. He would have been terrifying. He was so much taller than everybody else and he had a deformed foot. I, it, I mean, you'd probably have nightmares about him today if you'd seen him walking around. So, of course, they decided to, to give him the vampire treatment. Um, now, it's important to note, um, and I'm checking my time again because I could really go on about these things, but I do want to leave some time for questions, um, that, that even though Poland and Bohemia or the modern-day Czech Republic are very similar, they're, they're – there, I mean, in fact, today Polish people joke that that Czech people speak Polish. They just speak it with a high pitched accent, like a. Oh, I won't go there, but the, the um, you can find for yourself why how they think Czech people speak. Um, but the the origins of both these states and the environments in which these states form are very very different. Um, also, it's important to note that Bohemia and the Czechs were largely a homogenistic 
a cultural group. They had very few minorities, whereas Poland was at it, even at its very start, a very, very multi-ethnic state. And while we may call many of these people Poles today, it actually represented different tribes, the Polani, the Vistalans, the Silesians, the Pomeranians, which we would call Kashubians today, um, Danes, Swedes, and Jews, among many others. Um, also, uh, Bohemia was very inspired by Teutonic culture. That's not the case archaeologically from Poland. While they were obviously in contact with German peoples, their influences were coming from Scandinavia. And we see this in the Viking material culture of the time. Miesko did the unthinkable. Though the Slavic people, the Scandinavian peoples had, had moved down the Oder in Varta and influenced the Slavs, it was Miesko's people that conquered them. Jomsburg, if you want to believe Wolin was Jomsburg, was destroyed by Miesko. Um, however, that's not to say that, they, that it was a Slavic people triumphing over a Scandinavian peoples. Um, in fact, we see exactly the opposite. Polish swords from the era found in the lakeside at Ostrof Letniski have Danish runes on them. Um, we're not even sure that Miesko himself was not Danish and that the early Polish court didn't speak Danish. Miesko's group adopted Slavic languages, but at least early on, there's no distinction. In fact, in your own English chronicles, when we talk about English stuff, when they're, they're talking about Viking peoples raiding the countryside, a lot of times they're talking actually about Polish soldiers. Um, the um, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, in another slide. Um, but but certainly um, it's important to note that that that, mo that much of the the later Scandinavian force that marched across England was actually gathered in Poland. Um. At any rate, Miesko dies and his son takes over, Bolslav I. Um, Bolslav is the first king of Poland. Um, he marries a whole bunch of times. You can look at it here. It's pretty impressive how many times he marries. Um, he commands among the largest kingdoms in all of Europe through his conquests. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those conquests now. Uh, but he ruled as a king during his last year of his reign. So primarily throughout the, his life, he was known as a duke. He was Duke Bolslav the first. He's known as Bolslav the Brave or Bolslav Trobry. Um, he's a um, a pretty tough figure in Polish history, and I'm, I am going fast here because I have a lot more slides than I'm going to give you to today. Um, Bolslav took that state. So if you look here at the darker red representing that state, Miesko decided uh, Bolslav put it out. If you'll notice something, other than for, for the, the, the Bohemia itself, he actually conquers all of Great Moravia. He also conquers into what we would call today the Ukraine. He spreads his kingdom very large and very wide. It does lose, interestingly enough, he loses the one area that, that perhaps Miesko was most famous for taking, which is that area of Woland or Pomer Pom Pomerania, uh, which you can see is actually broken off from the kingdom. It's also during this time that Poland gets its patron saint of Saint Adalbert. You can see Adalbert here by having his head cut off and his spear um, doing it. Uh, Bolslav actually gains the remains back. Uh, he takes it and gathers up all the bones. He pays to, to have him uh, uh, Adalbert uh, taken to Giesno. And he meets with a guy named Odo III. Odo wants to make... Um, Bolsov, one of his, you know, pretty much his generals, his warlords, to help in a campaign which is going to unite Christendom. Uh, Odo the Third actually goes to to Hungary as well, and, and, and of course uh, makes uh, Saint Stephen a um, uh, a king. But with Bolsov, he actually decides to make a cool trade. So Bolsov, this is, this is an interesting take on the medieval world. Bolsov says, "I got the bones of this saint." And Odo goes, well, I got the spear that pierced the side of Christ. He said, I'll trade you his arm for the spear. And he says, deal. And so Odo takes the, the arm and, and um, Bolslav takes the spear. And so that spear you see Bolslav with all the time, and he's pretty much depicted with it nonstop, is supposedly the spear that pierced the side of Christ. Um, and um, Odo got the arm. Now, interestingly enough, if you were to put St. Adalbert back together today, it's important to note that St. Adalbert would have been a very interesting human specimen as he has something like four or five legs 
and like six arms if you put all his pieces back together. Uh, that's not uncommon with most medieval saints. Uh, the relic um, business was very big. Bi relic hunting was very, very big business for these guys. And I'm talking fast, but I want to go on to some more um, stuff. But um, Odo dies before any of his ambitions could be realized. Uh, it's an interesting side note in history. But as soon as o Odo the Third is dead, Bolsloff says, "Well, I don't have to. I don't have to support him anymore." He backs a candidate for Holy Roman Emperor who doesn't get it, and then he goes to war again and he continues to fight everybody until he dies. Now, I said Poland actually went to England, and that's exactly what happened. Um, so Poland interfered with a lot of other nations during this time period. I said it was one of the biggest states of the time period. It was also uh, one of the most powerful militarily. Uh, while we tend not to think of English history in these terms, uh, most people who, who study English history will know the name Canute and Harold. Um, in fact, if you, you read a lot of Icelandic sagas, those two feature prominently. Um, during one of their trips, right, you know, um, uh, Canute and Harold actually um, go to Poland to fetch their mother, Sigurd, who's living with her brother, Bolslav, at the time. And Bolslav says, what are you two doing? Are you getting up to tr trouble? And they said, oh, yeah, we have trouble. We're going to go claim England. You know, it's part of our, our thing. And Bolslav actually provides them with 3,000 Polish troops. Uh, most of these were mustered into service. These are almost all, they're a mix of cavalry and footmen. Uh, most of these were mustered into service at Gietz, which I have a photo of coming up. But it's interesting to point out that the, um, the, the Viking army that invaded England, at least about a third of the army that invaded England came from Poland. Um, so, and, and in fact, um, Canute establishes the Huskarls, who you can see in the Bayou Tapestry, uh, later on, but the Huskarls are actually modeled after the Joms Vikings, the guys of Woland in Poland. Uh, just an interesting side note to think that the, the, those those famous um, English warriors, the Huskarls, were actually um, brought out and modeled after soldiers in Poland. Um, he also interferes in Russia. Um, uh, Bolslov had initially tried to conquer portions of, of the Ukraine, uh, but later on, um, uh, one of the uh, princes, a man by the name of Sviatopolk of Kiev, actually comes and pitches the idea that, you know, Kiev could be Christian. The Rus could be Christian. Right now, they, they've adopted Eastern Orthodox. You know, if you can help me get Kiev back from uh, the head of Novgorod, Yaroslav, actually, at the time. Um, if he says, if you can get me Kiev back, I'll, um, I'll convert all of the, my Russian principality to Catholicism. And Bolslav says, good deal. And he goes and he marches his army and mops the floor with the Rus, uh, sets up Sviatopolk, calls it a day, heads back to Poland, in which case uh, Sviatopolk and the bishop he left behind get killed. Um, so it doesn't last. But for the short period of time, Bolslav decides who the, the, the grand prince amongst the Rus is going to be and that it's going to be a Catholic grand prince. Doesn't work. In 1024, at the end of his life, um, he actually decides that amongst the other things he's going to do, and you'll notice he's still holding that spear even in this image here, he decides he's going to crown himself king, which he does. Um, a, a, the... the, the um, the Holy Romans, the no, the Germans pretty much are, are fighting a civil war. He crowns himself king and everybody lets it go. Unfortunately, he dies two months later. And what happens is, is the kingdom falls apart. Um, it's nice to think it would be nice to think that Bolslav established a great kingdom that lives on to this day, but it doesn't. It falls completely apart. Um, he's succeeded by his um, second oldest son, Miesko II. Um, and then several other people take control until we actually get to a guy that, that we only remember now as Bolslav the Forgotten. He doesn't even get a number. Um, he's actually not listed usually as a king of Poland, um, but he, he pretty much doesn't do anything. And what happens is a period in which um, something really bad happens for the Polani. Uh, the, the, an invasion by the end of 1039 or so, there's an invasion by the Duke of Bohemia. Remember, Bolslav had attacked these people a couple times. 
the the Czechs of Bohemia were the last descendants of the great Moravia. Um, they invade into Poland. And we have a picture here of some of these invasions. Now, here's where it gets problematic. Now, if you go to a, a Polish museum, what you're going to hear is that the, the, the Czechs um, attacked unprovoked. They literally come in and they just smash everything. They smash Poznan, they smash Gezno, they smash Ostrov, the Niski, they turn Gietch, uh, which you can see there, very small lettering, but you can see it down south of Ostrov, the Niski, uh, kind of between south between uh, Poznan and Gezno. Um, they, they smash these areas. Um, however, there is a, um, a, oh, and he takes all the relics. He takes all those different arms and legs of Adalbert and he takes them back to Prague. The Poles are so devastated that the area of Velka Polska pretty much is, I don't want to say uninhabitable, but there's not many people left there. And the entire state of Poland, within the course of a decade, the center of Poland shifts from that area in and around Gezno to the area in and around Krakow. This was that Vistlandia area or Malopolska as it's known now, lesser Poland, but it's actually the center of the Polish state moving forward. Now, I do want to talk to you about why this is a terrible idea and why this is this, this story of the Czech um, Duke attacking unprovoked is probably not true. Um, first of all, contemporary accounts of the whole thing are very strange. They're inconclusive by any stretch of the imagination. What do we do know? Well, we know the Romanesque cathedral in Gezno is destroyed in the process and that the grow to Getch is abandoned. So it, this is, you're seeing Getch here. They were actually building a new castle at Getch when this happens. In fact, you can see the foundations of that castle. They never built it. Now, it's hard to imagine that a, a Christian monarch came in and smashed the cathedral and burned it to ashes. That's just not acceptable. What's likely occurred at Poland at the time is a very bad pagan uprising. Remember, most of the people living in that state were not Catholic. The, the nobles were, and they were forcing their religion upon a whole bunch of other people. But most of the people in the Polonia region had not been Christian for very long. They didn't probably look at it as a unifying principle. It's very likely, and in, in, in sadly enough, and, and there's a lot more I could discuss about this, but, but it's very likely that, that pagan Polish people destroyed the church. And it's even more likely that under this interpretation that Bredislaw, the Duke of Bohemia, actually invaded to capture and protect the relics so they could not be destroyed. So rather you have a Czech army leading a foray into Welka Polska, in which they actually probably captured all, you know, they captured some lands they could, but they also just took all the relics from the, the, the pagan uprising. Things get better for Poland, but they actually, you know, um, under Duke Casimir, you'll notice there's no more any kings anymore because um, the, the king title was only because Bolslav said he was king. Um, most Polish rulers did not have that power. They were able to restore um, um, some of Poland's rule. How did they restore that? They went crawling back to the Holy Roman Empire and they said, we will be a duchy within the Holy Roman Empire. And the Germans accepted this, and Poland was able to get back on its feet. However, this Poland, once again, was, was centered in Krakow at Wall, in, 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 um, in a very different region, a mountainous region in, in, in southern and eastern Poland, as opposed to the plains in which the Poles actually uh, derive from. Um, Bolslav II was able to capture the title of king. Remember, he's not really the second, even though he has the title of second. Remember, there's also the... The uh, Bolslav, that, that it's the Bolslav, the Forgotten, who's not given a name. Uh, Bolslav II is able to establish, reestablish some order in the area uh, of of Polonia, the area of, of, of Greater Welka Polska. Um, but he's actually overthrown by his own people, so he gets the title of king. Uh, but he's actually overthrown as a result, and things just kind of fall apart from there. I don't want to go through all these slides, but there is. Um, there, there is a more tolerance towards Jewish peoples, and then things really fall apart for the Polish state. So with going into the later time periods, what happens to Poland? Why, did, why does that state no longer exist? Uh, and, and the reasons are really short. The, the basic reasons are, are twofold. Uh, one is 
Um, the Polish culture moves away from an idea of primogeniture to an idea of agnatic seniority. And what that means is, 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 is um, instead of one person inheriting all the lands, the lands are actually split amongst all the sons. So you, you, you start to get uh, Dukes of Mazovia, Dukes of Malapolska, Dukes of Welkopolska, Dukes of Silesia, and they spread power amongst these people. To make matters worse, those German folks, which are still only in central Germany at this point, they haven't even moved into eastern Germany in the areas in and around Berlin, they're actually invited to settle in Poland. Um, the Duke of Mazovia actually invites the Teutonic Knights to begin operations in Poland in 1230. German crusaders are going to move in. They're going to Germanize large portions of the population. And those Prussian peoples, those Baltic peoples that had martyred Adalbert become German. In fact, the Prussians become more German than the real German peoples in the sense that it's from these Prussians that the true state of Germany was born today. But that's a story for a way different time. Eventually, though, Poland will be reunited under Casimir the Great, um, or Vladislav the First, and then Casimir the Great. We can see Casimir here. Now, it'd be great to say he unified Poland, and we were going to get into a new Renaissance. We were, unfortunately, Casimir um, dies, and his dynasty and this dynasty of these early Polish rulers is over. Um, in fact, today he's known as Casimir the Great. And, and the most famous thing he's, he's probably known for, other than for reuniting Poland and, and establishing Poland, because, of course, he's going to die, um, is he invited all, uh, unfortunately, at the time period, France and um, Germany were going through um, anti-Jewish sentiments, and he actually affords the Jews special protection. He protects his Jewish subjects, and he initially marries a woman from Lithuania. And, and um, this connection with Lithuania is what's going to become the second Polish state. Uh, this is known as the, uh, this connection would eventually lead to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, which if you look here is very different from the, the state of modern day Poland. The Poland of, of the Commonwealth is actually, if, if you wanted to put a center nail in it, I bet you it would be in Belarus today, or maybe the Ukraine. It's certainly more Ukraine than Poland is. Uh, it, it actually ruled Kiev is actually a part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is still centered. It, it'll be centered in Warsaw. Um, and, and, and once again, it'll, Poland will reassert itself as one of the largest kingdoms in, in all of Europe. But I do want to just stop here with some conclusions about the kingdom that was for a very short period of time. Uh, so what I talked about here today was about a kingdom that was established by Duke Miesko I and King Bolslav I which represented a succession of, of two very, very strong rulers. You can see them both here. And uh, this is inside, I think this is inside, it's probably inside Gesno Cathedral. Um, but I, I don't remember where this photo is it's off the top of my head. It may be in Poznan. Um, under Miesko, Poland grew to become one of the largest states in, in all of Europe. And then under Bolslav, Polish, Poland would become not just a large kingdom, uh, but a, a, a major player on the international stage, which led to, to Bolslav's recognition as a king. Um, Christendom played an important role in both conquest and foreign affairs, but the people of Poland during this period, even though they're, 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 the kings are seen here holding the cross, was a land of Vikings and vampires. And by that, I mean it was largely pagan, Nordic, and Slavic peoples. And it's these peoples that led to the destabilization of the state uh, which Miesko and Bolslav had done, um, and the, the collapse of it in many ways. True restoration of Poland wouldn't come till many centuries later under Casimir the, the Great. Um, and, and while lots made of the, lots made of this kingdom, because if you were to look at Poland's modern day territorial boundaries, the Poland of today doesn't match with the Commonwealth. If you were to name, if you were to say your state is based on the Commonwealth, it should include large portions of other nations. But the nation that exists today is very similar to the state carved out by Miesko in the late 10th century. So the modern day Polish state geographically 
looks very similar to the the Polish state that existed in the late 10th and early 11th centuries. It, and it was also the only time in which the Polish state was actually ruled by true Poles, as in people of the Polanyi tribe. Later on, it was ruled by peoples that 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 that, that are now called Polish. But peoples that probably originated as part of the Vistalani or uh, Mazovian tribes at different times, being that when the capital was at Krakow and then later at Warsaw. Um, um, the conversion of Catholicism was not a seamless transition. And there's good likelihood, based upon archaeological resident, re evidence, that the Pius dynasty, that Bolslav and Miesko were actually primarily, that most of their bloodline was actually of Danish origin, and, and how clearly they were. They were Polish is up to some debate, but they are viewed as Polish, which is 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 very different. Later Polish kings uh, were a mix of Hungarians, Lithuanians, and Swedish uh, rulers. Um, the the most famous uh, Polish rulers in 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 the early modern era were all from not from the country. In fact, it, there are very few rulers of Poland up until recent days that were actually of Polish descent. The exception was the Piast dynasty. Um, and also, it's easier to talk about this time period for, for Polish nationalism, of course, because Prussia doesn't exist as a state. Um, and while we, we look at, you know, today, uh, portions of old Prussia are inside, are controlled by Russia. Portions of old Prussia are inside, um, obviously, um, in eastern Germany. A substantial portion of old Prussia is, is in, inside the modern day Poland, but, but there was no Prussia at this time, making it very easy um, to 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 look at Polish heritage clearly. Um, there's a lot of questions. Uh, you could get into a, a going down a rabbit hole. Um, were the benefits of Christendom? Miesko took Christendom because he had to. I mean, he wanted peace with the Holy Roman Empire. Was it worth it? Um, considering it led to the destruction of the state, um, you know, a century later. Um, uh, if whole, if Otto the Third hadn't died, would Poland and Hungary been fully integrated in the empire? That's something that could have definitely happened. Um, and certainly, if, if Otto the Third was as great as everybody thought he was going to be, maybe he would have conquered all of the the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium. Um, uh, and there's lots of different ways we can look at that. Um, is Bratislava's a scapegoat to mask religious and political upheaval? I mean. You know, is he, a, he really the villain that everybody everybody in Poland would paint him out to be, or is he some sort of, um, you know, protector of Christendom? Really, um, and, and then more importantly, if you really want to get into the hypotheticals, should Poland even be called Poland? Um, you know, in 1040 when they moved the capital, the the the, the control and power um, to Krakow, should it have been called Visland? Um, that, I mean, that, that sounds very, I'm sure that many Polish people would go that, that absolutely should not have happened. It was, you know, at that point it's Malopolska. Um, but the reality is that portion had not been controlled by the Polanyi tribe. Um, and, and what if Poland could have been, um, not divided into a whole bunch of duchies? Would that have made a difference in, 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 in Poland's restoration efforts in Poland being a major player through the rest of the early middle ages? In, instead of really not reappearing as a major player on the world stage until the late medieval and, and, and Renaissance periods. Uh, with that, I will open it up. I know this is a very strange topic and there could be questions about what do you mean when you say this word and stuff like that. I will open it up to some broad comments here, uh, but I do appreciate you guys all uh, spending the time today and learning a little bit about a culture uh, a bit different than our own. And if you haven't figured it out yet, yes, I was there to, um, I, I, I had just gotten done at the time period uh, when I went to Poland, I actually was working. I had worked at San Marcos Pueblo and was very interested in the Pueblo revolt. And the thing that drove me to Poland in many ways was the study of this great uh, non-Christian uprising that possibly happened in the 11th century and looking at the archaeological evidence of non-Christian peoples in the early Christian state, which is not really that much different when you think of Pueblo peoples living in uh, 17th century New Mexico. Um, different in time period, different cultures, obviously, but, but similar uh, reactions with uh, pretty much a, uh, a uprising against Christianity 100 years after they, they adopt the, the faith. Where did the early Jews come from? 
there's a debate. Um, and in fact, I don't think I really talked about it in my last talk. There's, there's some people that firmly believe that Eastern European Jews are all descendants of the Khazars. I don't believe that's the case. Um, the Khazars are contemporaneous with the talk I just gave here. Uh, if you don't know, the Khazars were a Turkic speaking peoples that converted to Judaism um, and, and fought with both Islam and uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, as well as the Russian states. Um, Sviatoslav would, would destroy them. The, the short answer is I don't think anybody really knows where Eastern Jews actually come from. There's some debate that they were actually settled at least initially in Western Germany, uh, in the kind of like the Frankfurt area or in Eastern France, and that they moved further East. Um, certainly that makes sense from an archival standpoint from what we're talking about, because at the same point we can trace in, in Polish history, we can trace the, the Casimir um, inviting the Jews to settle in Poland and giving them special status and protecting them. Um, at the same time, the French and Germans are, are, are heavily persecuting um, their Jewish minorities. Um, and this was, uh, this was a very, um, important role. This was a very smart decision. So Casimir, yes, he was a great guy. He was a very smart and loving guy, and I'm sure he did good, but he was also um, working in his best interest, bringing in Jewish peoples, the Polish state. It's, it's important to note that when we think of the Polish state today, if you were to go to Poland today, it's made up of all mostly people that identify as Poles. If you were to travel back at any other point in history, uh, and, and this is largely a result of the Nazis in Germany. But if, if you were to travel back any other point in history and went to Poland, in the lands of Poland, you would find a very multi-ethnic state, which included Germanic peoples, included Slavic peoples, included uh, Jewish peoples, included uh, Baltic peoples, included um, Hungarians, which are actually Magars. It would have included Turkic peoples. It would have included a vast majority of peoples. And when we look at, at these these early medieval graveyards, we see all of these peoples represented in these the, the, these burial practices. So it's very important to note that, that that Jews had always been a very important subject. But a lot of, I mean, it had been important part of Poland. But it was with Casimir that they came in in large numbers. And primarily what he was looking to do is in unifying his state, what he had was a bunch of Slavic peoples that didn't view themselves as unified at all and really didn't like the idea of an overarching king. What Casimir was doing was taking a population that was being persecuted elsewhere that he thought would be incredibly loyal to him and inviting them to settle in his country so that he had loyal subjects all throughout his lands. And I know it seems strange to think that the, 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 the Jewish peoples would be focused on that, but these were peoples that were largely in the medieval world they had. They were highly educated, could handle money, could handle lo could give loans. They were a very important, uh, regardless of, of religious ideas, from an ethnic standpoint, they were a very important peoples um, to Casimir, and they represented a great leap forward. The other great leap forward, of course, for Poland, which is slightly outside of our discussion, is the, the incorporation of Lith the Duchy of Lithuania in with Poland. It's initially done through marriage and then eventually done through a constitution um, that allows both groups. And I have a separate talk uh, called With Fire and Sword, where I talk primarily about how Poland moves east into the current day states of, of Belarus and Lithuania. But the Lithuanians, the, the other um, later on, the other lifeblood that adds to Poland. And while Lithuania is a very small country today, once again, in, in historical context, it was a very, very important country. And together, the, the, uh, the Polish and Lithuanian peoples ruled most of what we would call Central and Eastern Europe. Matt, I have a question. Okay. I, have, I actually have two, but I don't know if you have time for both. Um, one is... Uh, later, we see Hungary on the map, but I understand they are not a Slavic language group. No, they're not. In fact, we can go. I, I we probably shouldn't go back to the slides right now just because of of time. the The Hungarians are actually Magyars. There are Turkified finno ugric peoples. If that sounds like a mouthful, it is. So imagine a group of Finns living in uh, what is today Central Russia. So a Finnish group of people a group that spoke, that lived like Finnish people, lived there. The Turks move in, the Turkish people, the Bulgars and the Khazars, primarily the Khazars who, who eventually convert to Judaism. 
the Khazars move in and these Finnish people take on all these Turkic um, cultural traits. They, in fact, they eventually are so Turkified that when they're asked who their ancestor is, they say it's Attila the Hun. Arapad claims that he, he's, he's Attila's ancestor. So these are people that view themselves as Turkic, but they're actually kind of a, a one of these Finnish groups that's interbred so much with Turkic that you can't tell the difference. And then they move into Central Europe. The Magars move into Central Europe, and these Turkified peoples um, are, are the, uh, the one, the Hungary, which is separating. The other group that's separating them is, of course, Romania and Moldova. If you don't know, Romania and Moldova actually speak a Latin or Romance language. In fact, Moldovia and Rom Moldovan and Romanian are actually what Latin language sounds like when it hasn't been Germanized. So Italians have lots of Germanic words. They were conquered by the Lombards and the Ostrogoths, and they take on lots of Germanic words. Um, the Sicilians take on lots of Arabic words, right? Um, the um, and the Romanians take on some Turkic words, but not many. Interestingly enough, the French. French is a Latin language. It takes on lots of Frankish words, German, Germanic words from them. Even, even Spanish takes on both Arabic words and some Gothic words uh, from the Visigoths. Romanian in Sardinia, which is that island off the coast of Italy, never really, I mean, they get conquered by peoples. But they managed to maintain a very similar language. And actually, interestingly enough, Sardinian is actually closer to um, uh, Cor Corsican in Sardinian is actually closer to Romanian than it is to, uh, it shares a lot of commonalities that doesn't, similarities that it doesn't share with Italian today. Uh, strangely enough, um, the, the weird case. But they are Romance languages. I know Moldovan, you think, well, God, they must speak a, La you know, a Slavic language that you, know, you probably have a picture that people in Moldova are or as Slavic as they can be. Also, it's interesting to note that Romania, the, uh, which includes Transylvania, where, where Dracula comes from and where we get the idea of a vampire, um, is, is, is a, a Latin, yeah, Latin speaking area. Uh, that being said, Hung Hungary and Poland actually have a complex relationship in which those countries are actually so intertwined in some ways, even though they don't share a language. Uh, in fact, Poland, uh, many Polish people view Hungary, I mean, Hungary is one of the few uh, nice nations in Europe, probably because even though Hungary has at times uh, kind of tried to take parts of, you know, try uh, rule Poland directly, um, it's never been an aggressive neighbor this way that uh, um, modern day Germany and Russia and Sweden and Bohe or the Czech Republic have all been very, very aggressive neighbors to Poland. Hungary is kind of that one sweet neighbor that they look at. And also some of their greatest rulers were actually Hungarians. Uh, my favorite, actually, if you were to ask me, the most fascinating Polish ruler is not Miesko or Bolslav, but it's actually Stephen Bathory, who was the elected king of Poland. He was a Hungarian. In fact, his, his, I guess it would be his niece or his cousin was Elizabeth Bathory, who's the most famous probably female serial killer of all time. But he was the guy that not only did he revolutionize Polish military, bringing in the hussars and, and all the, the military tactics that we recognize with early modern Poland. He's the guy who beat Ivan the Terrible really bad. I mean, beat him so bad that Ivan had to, 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 to bow before Stephen. Um, he, he was the guy that, that a lot of the Polish nobles didn't like him because he was, he was very much a Renaissance ruler. He was very bright. He actually spent a lot of time having people write things about how great he was. Um, but militarily, he, he, he fact, he would have conquered, uh, we can look at his history and we can say he would have absolutely conquered more for Poland had the Polish nobility not wanted to stop wars and, and kind of limit his power. If they had left him to his own devices, Poland probably would have marched across most of Eastern Europe and into Asia. You, when you were in Poland, and I imagine other places too, um, excavating places where there were human remains, in some cases, very, very old ones. Um, is there like an emotional response to that? Is there a solemnity or a reverence for handling these human remains that were people that you know have otherwise been forgotten do you have any sense of that um it, it, 
I think everybody, everybody reacts to death differently. Um, certainly for me, my time in Poland, I would, I would argue that I was primarily interested in from a scientific standpoint. Um, I think one of the things that separates me from, from most people that that work, most people who go back to work in Europe from the Americas, I should say, and most people who work in Europe today are working on their ancestors. Um, you'll notice that my talk here is perhaps not as flattering of the Polish state. It is very, it talks about how powerful and important it was. And I tried to make sure people understand just why it's important, but I was there from a, a, um, an academic standpoint. I was interested in how, how people were living and what's the story behind the story. So when you pull away all the nationalism and, 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 and just so pride, we have it in our own country. What was the real story of what was going on there? That being said, in, in working with professionals at the Museum of First Pius and, and with several other museums in the area, I always felt like they always treated the remains. The, these were their ancestors and they were very proud of it. And even if they probably weren't their ancestors, they were treated as if they were their ancestors. So even in cases where we were almost positive the person wasn't Polish, they were still treated with great respect. Now, the difference comes, I see somebody asking questions, do these human remains go into museums or were they reburied? They were not reburied. Um, they believe very strongly that these people, uh, uh, the, the, these remains can tell a story, a very important story of, of Poland's history. And they are actually, in some cases, on display for, for various regions. Um, these burials can have a um, have a, a, a lot of variable things. Like one of the things we were always asked to do, and um, all of this is actually reconstructed from a paper that I, I gave back in college. One of the first things they told you is to check the hands, check the hands. And it took me a while to figure out why they're telling me to make sure there's nothing in the hand when I'm digging up human remains. Uh, it's because a lot of times they were actually, they, I, I joke, I don't know if this is the actual reason why it was told to me that they, they, they're often given coins to, um, to pay for the ferryman on their trip to hell. Right. It, that, that's a colorful story. Slavic folklore is amazing and it's totally immersed in the culture. Uh, but the real reason you want to check to see if there's a coin sticking in the hand is because if you have a coin sitting in the hand, you know, that burial post dates, whatever dates on that coin. So it's actually a really great way to know what you're looking at. Uh, somebody put Nancy put my dad's parents from Hungary. My grandma baked Swedish cookies as did her sister. Grandma had Turkish appearance, dark skin and heavy features. Um, a bully means pain in, in Polish. Um, I, I, uh, I didn't know bully me. I, I didn't remember bully means pain in Polish. It's not both. I, I don't think it means pain as in King. I don't think his name was pain. Um, um, the um, Chobri is what he was called by, which meant the brave. Um, but the, the um, Hungarian peoples in general uh, tend to have very Turkish appearance, even though they're, they're actually, as I said, linguistically, they're actually like Finnish people, right? Um, they're, they're actually, they, they carry um, several Turkish appearance. It's interesting that you can go from a, within a couple of generations, you know, Hungary is an interesting study in and of itself that you can go from a several generations where there's a guy named Arpod who claims that he's the, he's the great grandson of Attila and that he's going to destroy all of um, of the West. To within a couple centuries, his ancestor would be named Stephen, and he would actually achieve not only kinghood but sainthood. You know, so he would he would go. You'd get that big of a a drastic change in in how you're viewed as a people. Um, and Hungary, of course, would would serve as the backbone for protecting uh, much of Western Europe. Um, throughout the middle ages um, and, and later time periods uh, specifically against the Ottoman Turks, which are a completely different type of Turkic people. Um, Khazars are actually in, in ogre, uh, Uger, I, I'm sorry, my pronunciation of Turkic, um, especially antiquated versions of Turkic is, is really bad. Uh, Khazars were a different type of Turkic than Ottomans. The Ottomans are actually, um, uh, they're Turk, they're actually, Ottomans are actually what happens when you take a group of Turks and you Persianize them and then Latinize them uh, or, 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 or Hellenize them. I should say Hellenize because even though they, they, they were, they were influenced by the Roman empire, the Roman empire at this point was Greece, right? In, in Turkey. Um, 
they, they're a good example of what happens when you Hellenize and Persianize Turkic peoples, whereas the Magyars are a good example of what happens when you 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 take a a um, pretty much a European peoples and Turkify them. That's a strange. The world is full of strange nuances. Uh, more confusing yet is to, to try to have me explain why the hell Prussia, which is centered in Poland, would be the ones to unify Germany, and why the Holy Roman Empire, which is now Austria, is like an offshoot, so that everything German, everything great in German, actually comes from a people's named after peoples that were not German speaking that lived in Poland in the uh, ninth century. That's a, probably a more confusing story about world history, uh, especially when we think that when we, we, we really want to push something as being German, a lot of times we'll say that's oh, very Prussian. That's very aristocratic in, 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 in the capital of um, Germany today is Berlin, which isn't even located in an area in which there were German settlers during the early middle ages. Well, thank you very much, Matt. We're um, getting close to our time out. Um, we are. I, I'm past my time out. Thank you. Thank you for humoring me. Hopefully you learned some about Poland. Um, please, if you're interested, learn more. It's a great area to go, not to go visit now with the COVID pandemic, but hopefully you had a fun time. And we're going to be back to topics more associated with New Mexico and uh, conquistadors in the next several lecture series. But Happy Halloween for now. Happy Halloween and thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt.